Well, we're reviewing the book of Psalms. And of all the books of the Bible, in some respects, this one is the most frustrating because mostly, almost all the other books, historical books, prophetic books, what have you, it's not hard by doing a little bit of research to come up with some surprises, to get, to, to get some tie together events that help, help it along expositionally. But here we are plunged into a hymn book. And um, while we will hopefully uh, pull together some expositional content, some background, historical background here, and the meaning of certain vocabulary there. The real challenge of the book is not expositional in the usual sense. It's really devotional. And uh, the proper way to do this really is to take each psalm and deal with it devotionally. And you can easily spend several hours on these, even the littlest psalms. But there's 150 of them. If we do that, we'll be, we don't end up with a recording product that's going to be very useful to many. Because the people that should be immersing in them isn't the teacher, it's the student. What we really want you to do is get enamored enough with at least a few of these to really plunge into them. And when I say plunge into them, I don't mean just read them, but to really immerse in them. One of the fascinating things as I pull together research on the, on the Psalms is throughout history, how many of the great people that have made history um, both in America and also Europe and elsewhere, were people who were immersed in the Psalms. There are portions of the Psalms that were their favorite literature, bar none, favorite part of the Bible. And it's very easy to litter a talk with some notes of this guy and that guy and who held it dear. And I, I've tried to not do too much of that because I'm not sure it's that helpful. I think what we really want you to do is, uh, is how to em embrace the Psalms themselves. Um, so tonight, we're going to take three of them and um, uh, explore them a bit. Okay, so we're in Psalm 49. To the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. And uh, Korah, of course, was the one that rebelled and God took care of him, but his sons were not punished for that and they become very prominent in the Levitical structure and the music, musical side of that. Verse 1, hear this, all ye people, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. I want you to notice right away, this is not a psalm for Israel alone. The, the, the psalm is addressed to all the inhabitants of the world. So it's got a little different flavor than most of these. It's not a psalm of David, necessarily. Um, it's to the chief musician. It's a psalm, a, a song. Hear this, all ye people, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. In this psalm, which is to all people, the Hebrew term is a very unusual one. It's for the total human scene. It's analogous to the word in the Greek called cosmos, for all the world. And uh, so... And this is the way he addressed uh, 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 his, peop his people when he first put them in the land and 800 years later when he's about to put them out of the land. He uses the, this, this, this uh, strange term. I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Now there's that strange phrase we find in the Old English, a dark saying. The term there really is a term that today we would probably translate a riddle. Solomon was, a, that was his primary hobby in Solomon's case, but this isn't Solomon. It's again, it's a dark saying. There's a riddle implied. There's a parable. There's a hidden meaning here it implies. Next, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? Now, one of the questions, who's asking the question here? Is it the poor? Is it the rich? Is it you? Is it me? I'll leave that to you to chew on here. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Salvation is not for sale. There's no price adequate to pay for it. And... Uh, None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give God a ransom for him. That's a very key verse, verse 7. 
A very, very profound one. I normally don't quote from other commentators, but I can't resist lifting a little bit from Spurgeon. If you're collecting commentaries on the book of Psalms, Wearsby is a great one. J. Vernon McGee has some great stuff. Uh, but the classic, three-volume, typically, rendering is The Treasury of David by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But just here, just to give you on this verse, his, his comments were just irresistible. I had to include them. A king's ransom would be of no avail. A Monte Rose of rubies, an America of silver, a world of gold, a son of diamonds could be utterly contemned. O ye boasters, think not to terrify us with your worthless wealth. Go ye and intimidate death before ye threaten men in whom is immortality and life. <laughs> Virgin had, had a style like that. Continuing though, verse 8, for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases, ceases forever. What, let me not uh, tiptoe around this. What has purchased redemption? The blood of Christ. But there's no conception that comes close to equaling that. It, all the wealth of the world can't, wouldn't be as of no avail. But the blood of Christ has availed for you and I. And that's, that's already here in the Psalms, 800 years before the cross and all of that. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. Wow. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. And someone died. Someone asked the attorney, how much did, what, what did he leave? You know what the answer was? Everything. Didn't take anything with him. <laughs> In other words, whatever it is, you're leaving behind. That's not quite true, by the way. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. You can send it on ahead. Luke 16 will explain how that works. He, I love what Jim Elliott said. It's an oft-quoted line. I finally tracked it down. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. That's the real meaning of life. You know, we, we, we strategize, we career, we, we fight the battle, and, uh, uh, but we do it tactically. We stand back. The real issue is eternal. Are we living our lives in terms of the long-term gain? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Moving on, verse 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, that their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. It's interesting how subdivisions are always named after the guy's relative or his wife or whatever. The streets are named after his friends, whatever. And that's also, you know, a generation away, it's forgotten. They put their names on buildings, sure, but for how long? Even if building stands, do they remember? I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's all so vain. And that's the whole book of Ecclesiastes. We'll deal with that if you want to get into it. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This is their way. This is their folly. Yet their posterity approve their sayings. And uh, in other words, dust to dust has very few exp ex exceptions. Okay. The word sela. Many commentators think it's a musical term. I don't think so. I think I side with Bullinger and others who believe it's a thought connector. Pause and the, uh, the translation I stumbled onto, I thought, what Salem means is, think of that. <laughs> it's a pause to connect what's, what's behind what's coming forward. It's a, a thought connector. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. For he shall receive me. Selah. The word grave here, by the way, is an unfortunate translation. It really is the Hebrew term Sheol, the abode of the dead. The grave is a physical place. A person, you can own a grave. Somebody can own that piece of land. that you know, A grave is a tangible, physical repose of the remains. And so it's technically not a good translation because it's not the grave, it's the abode of the dead. No one owns Sheol. You can own a grave. You can't own Sheol. The, he, the Greek equivalent term is Hades. It's the abode of, of the departed. Redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. And there again we have that Selah term. 
That's twice in this psalm, which is kind of interesting. And uh, so it says, death shall feed them. What it actually, the Hebrew actually says is, death shall be their shepherd. Now, that's sort of a non-starter, isn't it? Yeah. See, the real issue in, in uh, verse uh, 15 is, what will you inherit at death? And by the way, it's not as simple as being saved or not being saved. If you're saved, you can't lose that. Christ did the whole thing. It's that your security in Christ is certain, but your inheritance may not be. Your inheritance, your right to rule with him, if so be that you're a partaker. Many people will, are saved, they'll be in heaven, but they will have forfeited their inheritance because of the life they lived. Interesting. Think it, check it out. That's, that's not free of controversy, but I suggest you might take a look at all of that. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of houses increased. See, part of the under, ter, underlying term, uh, term through the psalm is, why do the rich prosper? You know, that's, a, that's a recurrent theme. That was the, the issue in Job. That is the issue uh, in the book of Habakkuk. Um, you know, it's, it's disturbing to someone that is God-fearing, is that why do the wicked prosper? And why are the good punished? You know, why, does bad, why do bad things happen to good people kind of thing? A very recurrent theme. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers, and they shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perish. And so this is like evolution in reverse. Man is not as he's created, he's fallen. And he'll ultimately go the way of animals, but for the redemption. It's, so that's a little short Psalm 49. Let's take a look at the next one, Psalm 50. This is a Psalm of Asaph, who is the musical, one of the musical directors there. And uh, this is the first one we've encountered of Asaph, a musician. And he was one of the three great song leaders of Israel at that time. Haman, Asaph, and Ethan were the three uh, top musical leaders. And uh, this will reveal God as the righteous judge, to judge his people, and to judge the wicked. So it sort of picks up from Psalm 49 in the same flavor. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. Call to the heavens from above. He wants lots of witnesses. And this is all focusing on the covenant people, the people of the Jews, the children of Israel. And, uh, but verse 6 it needs to be said that he, the Lord Jesus Christ will be the judge. John 5.22 says that the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all the judgment to the Son. So even this is an Old Testament uh, perception here. Clearly Christ is at the center of all of this. Continuing, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor goats out of thy fold. What he's dealing with here is that the, the ordinances are not what God is interested in. It's the same flavor that he does to, that Jeremiah brings out in Jeremiah 7. In Jeremiah, he says, For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. What he's really saying, don't confuse these ceremonial ordinances with the reality of what I've really called you to do in terms of obedience to his way. That's what he's talking about. And how easy it is for all of us to substitute ceremonies for substance. We do that in so many ways, always. always. Micah says a similar thing in Micah 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, 
The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No. Micah 6, 8. Often quoted again and again. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to, walk, to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? It says it all. Strip away the ceremony. Strip away the, you know, the, the, the tapestries. The substance. What does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Continuing Psalm 50, at verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. See, God doesn't need us. He doesn't need our help. He gives us opportunities to praise him and to offer these things, but he doesn't need them. For every beast of the forest is mine, every, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy, in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou contendest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue to frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, and slanderest thine own mother's son." These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show salvation of God. And I highlight conversation is one of those six or eight words then the King James have a different meaning today. Conversation isn't talk, it's behavior, total behavior. So that's, many of your Bibles will have that annotated, of course. So that's a quick snapshot of 49 and 50. Now, it's very, very typical to try to ascertain the historical context, what, these, what may have given rise to these psalms. And these particular ones, it isn't too helpful, it's quite speculative, so I didn't get into that too much. What you do with each one of these, really, is just to reread them and reread them and meditate upon them and glean them for what they may bring to your awareness for, uh, to apply yourself personally. The next psalm that we're going to deal with is one that we have a pretty good perception of what the historical context was that brought this psalm about. And I've gone lightly over the first two because I think that's, they're pretty self-evident. But Psalm 51 is a classic. Many people who are not familiar with any of the other Psalms are all aware of Psalm 51. And the background, the historical background before we get the Psalm is in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And it's the famous uh, e uh, incident between David and Bathsheba. So let's skim through that before we jump into that Psalm. In 2 Samuel 11, first verse, it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. That last sentence is the first hint that there's a problem brewing. This general, this incredible military leader, wasn't with his men. He sent Joab, the, the head of the host, captain of the host. He's staying in Jerusalem. That's not, not like David. He's kicking back. He's letting them do the, the fighting right, with Ammon and Rabbah. David tarried still at Jerusalem. And therein the plot begins. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now, all kinds of speculations. Um, was she setting him up, some suggest, whatever. Was she really a stranger or had they met as a friend of the family? There are all kinds of 
nuances that some people will try to build upon, but we'll keep moving here and see what the, just what the text says. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So she's a married woman. In fact, she's married to one of the mighty men as a core group, the top fighters for David. He was one of them, one of his most loyal troops. David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Well, David's got a problem. Things, it's amazing how sin is never simple. Truth is simple. It's straightforward. Sin gets complicated. And sin begets sin after sin after sin. Anyway, David's got a problem. David sent to Joab, the captain of the host, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. They're, they're out there battling. Send, he wants Uriah to come home. Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. David said to Uriah, go down to thy house, wash thy feet. Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. So he gave him food, and he's hoping he'll go home, obviously. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said to Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and the Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. <laughs> David's, got, David's got a problem. David said to Uriah, Tarry here today, also and tomorrow, and I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and tomorrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And he, at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. Can you, you begin to realize the king's frustration? It came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. This is a sealed letter, obviously. Sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So he's arranging with his, 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 the, his, the commander of his army to make sure that Uriah is a casualty. That's basically what's happening here. Do you see the sins compounding? Obviously, he's, gonna, he's guilty of murder of Uriah. He's also entangling Joab into dishonesty. See, these things multiply. It came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war to the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he said unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerobosheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye not nigh or near the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. That's the point that Joab wants to get back to the king. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. The messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, 
there's a lot of speculation because what's going to follow here in chapter 13 may have been a substantial period of time later. But during that interval, what do you think it was like for David? He, on the one hand, thought he was getting away with it, and at the same time, it's destroying his life. Bathsheba herself was apparently a pretty sharp gal, because the history bears that out. Now, she was very skillful at obtaining the object of her ambitions in the palace over the following years. Uh, she was very quick and prompt in disclosing her problem to the king. That's very straightforward. Her activity in defeating Adonijah later on, under, uh, he, he uh, tries to take the throne. And she, uh, with Nathan, head that off. They're, very, they're really on their toes to uh, prevent, Adonijah was trying to prevent Solomon from gaining the throne. And her own son's succession, namely Solomon to the throne, she engineered that. And uh, she had ter terrific dignity as the king's mother. She wrote uh, so the 31st chapter of Proverbs, which is her intimate counsel to her son by his uh, intimate name, Lemuel. Um, so she acquits, aside from the, that event, her history acquits herself as a very able person. But let's go on to chapter 12. This is where David gets rebuked. The chapter follows chapter 11, but we don't know what the interval of time might have been. That interval of time between the two could be rather taxing. And the one that takes the initiative is not David. It's the Lord who sent Nathan. Nathan was a prophet. This isn't Nathan the son. There will be later a son of David called Nathan. This is No, this is Nathan the prophet. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came unto him, said unto him, tells him a story. There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. In other words, it's a pet. Okay? Was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Here's this poor man, the only thing he's got, the rich man took it for dinner. Can you visualize David hearing the story and starting to get angry? David's anger was greatly kindled against that man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Can you visualize the scene? Nathan's put this story on the table and David is incensed. And then we have one of the bravest moves by a person in the Bible. Nathan says to King David, Thou art the man. And then he continues. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Bear in mind, Nathan is talking to the king. The king would have to do nothing but frown, and his cohorts would put Nathan to death. He's insulting the king. Nathan has really crawled out on a limb. We need to understand the dynamics here. Thus saith the Lord God, and he gives us a charge. Thou art the man. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with thy sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. This is God speaking through Nathan to, 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 to David. The sword shall never depart from thine house. And indeed, the whole history of David is a tragic, tragic family history. 
of, of, of uh, sexual abuses and murder and rebellion and it, 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 it's, uh, it's a vivid, vivid fulfillment of this assertion by the Lord through David. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up an, uh, evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives, wives in the sight of this son. For thou did it, did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Indeed, Absalom does that very public dishonoring of the king in that very way later. Now to David's credit, confronted with this, David makes no apology, makes no denial. He stands up. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He sinned against a lot of others too. But the critical one, the most critical one, let's put it that way, isn't Bathsheba or Uriah or Joab or any of these other things or the city of or the nation, which he's all, he's sinned against all of them, really, by this behavior. You know, a man in his position can't sin privately. We had a president that disgraced the office of the president that we probably never recover from. No, I have sinned against the Lord, David says. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. He is, after all, the king... So that, they, that won't happen. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Interesting phrase. We hear this a lot. You know, when, when you do something against God, when you, when you disgrace your calling uh, uh, as a God-fearing person, you create an occasion for the enemies of God, uh, enemies of God to blaspheme. Blasphemy is bringing railing accusation is an equivalent term. And um, we often overlook that. When you see a very prominent Christian uh, personage fall from grace by some public disgrace, the injury that he does to the image of God in the minds of the unbelieving is part of the sin, a very serious part of the sin. We're all on parade. We need to know that. We need to understand that. We'll do it imperfectly, but we need to understand that. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that, Uri with, that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. It came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake unto them, and he would not hearken unto her voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? And, you know, they think it's going to be worse. It's going to be just the other way around. When David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth. He washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he came to his own house. And he required they set bread before him and he did eat. While he was ill, he fasted and all that. But once the child died, cleaned up, business as usual, went back to work. And the servants were surprised. And they said to the servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. He said, very important verse for us to understand. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And it's on this verse that many theologians argue this is a proof that children are saved because he will be with his child. That same argument can be advanced. I shall go to him. He says here, in the New Testament, in, the, in law school, as we call it, Romans 7, Paul tells us, without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, I, sin revived and I died. When you analyze this uh, uh, 
structure grammatically and the rest. There's a time that Paul was saved before the law was operative. For I was alive, and he's using the term of being saved here. I was alive without the law, outside the law, once. But when the commandment came, sin re revived and I died. As you analyze this, the only thing, you, the only thing that fits the situation is that, that Paul is talking about his, before he was at the age of accountability. So again, theologically, theologians will build their case on these two verses that a child is saved. I happen to agree with that, but I want to point out that's not free of controversy. Some people argue different things, you know, but, but uh, be that as it may. Let's go back to uh, 2 Samuel 12. And David comforted Bathsheba's wife and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son and called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So Solomon has several names. And uh, now David's wives and son. Okay, he had obviously Michael, Saul's daughter, way back in the beginning, but nothing came of that, as you probably know. Hinoam uh, uh, gave, gave birth to Ammon, who's going to be trouble too. Abigail, that was Nabal's widow, that whole story, had a son in Gilead. Micah, the king of Asher, had Absalom. Absalom leads a rebellion later. The wife of Hegith had Adonijah. Then Abital had another son, and Eglah had another son. Bathsheba comes along, wife of Uriah. Her first surviving son, first one died, the first surviving son with Solomon. Her second surviving son is a son by the name of Nathan. Matthew builds his genealogy on Solomon, the legal heir to the throne. Luke, the doctor, takes the bloodline from Nathan to, every, uh, prior to them both, they're identical, the genealogies in both Gospels. But from Nathan on, it goes to Mary, whose father adopts Joseph as a son. And uh, there's a great study there, we're going to get into it. There are a bunch of other sons of David that are mentioned, we don't know much about. The two of the important ones are Absalom and Adonijah. They both rebel in various ways. Absalom is the most serious of the two. And we'll come more to that later. That's why I'm highlighting it here. Okay, so having that historical background refreshed in our mind, let's take a look at Psalm 51, which clearly is written uh, in, uh, uh, of, of, this, of David's repentance. It has three major parts. The cry of his conscience and his conviction of sin, the first three verses. His cry of confession of sin and appeal for clemency and a cry for cleansing and communication. So it's in three sections. Now, let's remember that these superscriptions on your Psalms are part of the inspired record. Many people overlook that. They think this is just some kind of editorial comment. No, it's generally regarded by most scholars that that's part of the Psalm. To the chief musician, the Psalm of David, obviously. And it tells you what the occasion was. So there are several places like this where it is expressed as to what the historical occasion was that gave rise to the song. That doesn't limit its application. It just gives you a sense of the context here. Because this not only applies to David in this situation, it may apply to every one of us in a number of ways. When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba, this is the occasion. And here's David's psalm that he composed. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So that's David's plea, and the reason it's so dear to all of us, that needs to be our plea also. There's not one of us in this room that aren't in need of essentially the same kind of confession and appeal to the judge of the universe. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Now, transgressions is to step over. Transgressions is to step over the boundaries that God may have set up. The word iniquity is that which is just altogether wrong. And the word sin, I'll explain here in a little bit. The important thing here, first is first step, is that David admitted it. He owned it. He was not in denial. He confesses it. And in, in verse 2 and 3, the word for sin in the Hebrew is shatah, which is, means that like a, it, a word like for sin offering. In verse 4, it's a similar word, but in the Septuagint, in the, when translated in the Greek, they use the term hamatur, which is to miss the mark. And that's what usually the old English term for sin is like an archery term, missing the mark. And uh, so... 
I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That is the theme of this whole psalm. It needs to be the theme of our lives. We need to understand the reality here. The word uh, for uh, sin here is kata, which is a sin or like sin offering. And uh, the Greek translation three centuries before Christ's ministry in the Greek is the word from which we get the word sin. Uh, it, it's an archer to, to miss the mark, to miss the So that's the first three verses. Now we're going to go to the cry of confession of sin and appeal for clemency. David goes on and says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And uh, this is a tough one because many people say, gee, wait a minute, what do you mean? He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. Yes, indeed. They're all gone now. The critical one that eclipses all of that is God himself that he sinned against. Not demeaning the others, but that's the one he's focusing on here. Romans 3.23, most popular verse, should be in our list of memory verses. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us is in the same shoes as David. Sin against whom? Against Bathsheba? Of course. What could she do? He was king. Against Uriah, her husband? Of course. He was murdered by deceit. It's called duggery. Against Joab, by even involving him in this tryst and the rest. Against his family. I always get a, I'm always amused by these discussions among some attorneys about victimless crimes. There's no crime that's victimless. All kinds, you, you, you are sinning against anyone that loves you when you sin. Most of all, God himself. It's against the community of Jerusalem. He was king. It's a sin against the community of Jerusalem. President Clinton, what he did to this country and the nation is absolutely irreparable. Against the nation in which he was king, but the real issue that eclipses all of this is against God himself because he's the ultimate judge. And this is a sin against God, especially the way God had blessed David and the way God has blessed every one of us in this room. Two things we need to really be guarded against, ingratitude and presumption. Subtle, but deadly. David continued, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me doesn't mean that it was sin that caused him to be birth. He means he's born in sin. He's born with it. We, you and I have a genetic defect. Not that we're HIV positive. We're SIN positive. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There's no one that doesn't sin. Proverbs 30, There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Everybody thinks they're doing all right. Not so. In Romans 3.23, that's probably the key of them all. That for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can find, we could concatenate probably another dozen verses that hammer the same thing all through, all through the Bible from Genesis to Re Revelation. The sin nature. Samuel Johnson said, Every man knows that of himself which he dares not tell his dearest friend. Well, if the character is what you are when no one's looking. <laughs> Seneca said, we must say of ourselves that we are evil, have been evil, and unhappily, I must add, shall also be in the future evil. Nobody can deliver himself. Someone must stretch out a hand to lift him up. This is not a new idea. Continuing in Psalm 51, David says, behold, speaking to God, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. What's really going on, on the inside? Not the outside appearances, what's really going on in the heart. And then this critical verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You know, you get the impression that David's coming from a very hard place. It's not like he was really comfortable. He really thought he'd gotten away with it. He's coming out of a time of huge depression. Whatever the interval was between the sin and being confronted by Nathan, it was an agonizing time of covering up. You get the impression that David, it was not easy. It, not like he thought he'd gotten, really thought he'd gotten away with it. He knew he, had, he, he, he was torn up. A Christian cannot be comfortable in a sin. 
Purge me with hyssop. What do we mean by hyssop? Well, if we go to Exodus 34, the, uh, God says in Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord passed by, speak to Moses here, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. So God is a just God. That will by no means clear the guilty. He can't just pardon without it being paid for. That's the point. Socrates even recognized the paradox that's presented here. It may be that God can forgive sin, but I don't see how. That was Socrates' insight. If you've got a just God, it's got to be, someone's got to pay for it. You can't ignore it. Hyssop is the biblical term we see it all through the Bible. It's a, a hyssop is probably marjoram or it's a, a herb that has a little hair. It's the kind of thing you can, it, it's useful for sprinkling things on. It was used to apply the blood to the doorpost during Passover. I want you to notice how hyssop is in the Bible always associated with the sprinkling of blood. It applied the blood to the doorpost during Passover. When in Leviticus, Leviticus 14, where they're dealing with the cleansing of a leopard, you had two birds. One was thought the blood of the one was put on the other and it was turned loose. A picture of the resurrection and the, and the shed blood and so forth. One dipped the blood of the other and, and was released, but what was split, the blood was sprinkled with the hyssop. Numbers 19, where the ashes of the red heifer was applied, it was with hyssop. And uh, Hebrews 9.19, it was used to sprinkle the blood on vessels and all the way through. It's a summary verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 9. When Moses had spoken, the writer of Hebrews points out, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. More we sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Again, hyssop is tied to this idea of a sprinkling of blood. And what does the blood refer to? What does the blood refer to? Blood of Jesus Christ in anticipation. Not the blood of bull and goats. It's, 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 it's an exemplar. It's a tupos. It's a type of the blood that was shed on the cross. Hyssop. Sprinkled the blood. When you think of hyssop, it's used to sprinkle the blood. Hebrews continues, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. That's the dilemma of Judaism today. There's no place to shed blood, and you know without shedding of blood, there's no dealing with sin. They've got a huge, huge fundamental problem. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And the writer goes on. Without the shedding of blood, is, there's no remission. It's astonishing to discover how many churches are embarrassed about mentioning the blood of Christ. Well, that's old-fashioned. Indeed it is. Praise God. Okay, and then the final section is the cleansing and communion. David continues, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. You see, David needed a spot remover. You and I have one. You want to know what your spot, where your spot remover is? It's 1 John 1.9. Write it down, memorize it. 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9 is our spot remover. Blot out all mine iniquities, David Christ. And then he has this other verse that's so often sung in church. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. One of the most provocative words in that verse is the first word. The word in the Hebrew is bara, which means it's the same word that is in Genesis chapter 1. Barashit, bara, Elohim, and so forth. In the beginning, God created out of nothing. 
Nowhere in the Bible do you find a heart being healed, a heart being uh, uh, cured. You always see a new heart being given. Why? Because of Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and incurably wicked, Jeremiah points out. So David's not asking you to have his heart cleansed. He's not asking it for it to be repaired, improved, educated, enlightened. No, 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 no. Create in me a clean heart. He's asking for regeneration. And renew a right spirit within me or constant spirit within me. Second Corinthians 5, 17, all things have become new in the believer. Key concept. Now the next verse is one you and I cannot pray. Verse 11 doesn't fit us. It's a, he says here, oh, uh, yeah, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Saul could sweat that. Saul had the Holy Spirit was taken away from him. All through the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go like the wind. The, the guy that really understood the Old Testament was a guy by the name of Paul. He was trained as a Pharisee under Gamaliel himself. And what stunned him to come to grips with in his epistles, he tries to get that across, is the fact that you and I have a gift that the Old Testament saint would have dreamed for, and that is that the Holy Spirit was given without repentance. That you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is not, that is a New Testament concept. And it was Paul's privilege to have that revealed to him and to communicate it. That's why the Ephesians chapter 3 and other, many, of, many of Paul's epistles don't resonate with us because we're getting an answer and we don't know what the question is. The issue is that the, the, the sealing role of the Holy Spirit, that's distinctive to this peculiar people that God has called for what we call the ecclesia or the church. Not the physical church, the mystical church. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, David says. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Not restore the salvation. Many people misunderstand. No, re restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I love to ask this question. How many of you in this room are saved? My next question is, what have you done with it? David made a commitment. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted to thee. I won't ask you for a show of hands, or how many of you, how many people have you impacted? If you're any good, you probably have no idea. Because there's more than you probably have any idea. David continues, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Verses 14 and 15 are parallel. This is, you talked about, I've skipped all that tutorial front end this time, because you've heard it before by review, but this whole idea of parallelism. They're saying the same thing a different way. Deliver me, and my tongue shall sing aloud. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, or else I'd give it. Thou deliest not in burnt offerings. That's it. So a couple of questions for you to jot down and think about. What is the measure of your love? David poured his heart out in Psalm 51. He'd really blown it. He was in big trouble. But he stepped up to it. He didn't deny it. He admitted it. He confessed it. Threw himself on God's mercy. What is the measure of your love? If I ask how many of you love God, I get all the hands. Sure, of course. But how much? What's the measure of your love of God? It's the estimate of your own sins. How, how spiritually mature are you? Well, how much do you hate sin? When you hate sin as much as God hates sin. I'm not talking about hating the sinner. We get that backwards. We love the sin and we hate the sinner. No, no, it's the other way around. But when you hate sin the way God hates, hates sin, then you're maturing. See? Is it possible that you do not confess your sins? Have you really confessed your sins before him? When was the last time you wept over your sins? David wept over his sins. 
When was the last time you cried out in the night because of your failures before him? There is forgiveness with him, but there must first be confession on our part. Easy thing to jot down in notes, easy thing to give intellectual assent for, but do we really do it? David Final finishes up, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness and the burnt offering and whole burnt offering. And then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Oh, uh, altar. And so is this couple of comments about David. David at his zenith was a, was a victorious warrior, clever general. He subdues the Philistines to the west. That was Saul's nemesis. The Syrians and Hadadezer in the north, the Ammonites and Moabites in the east, and the Edomites and Amal- Amalekites in the south. All these traditional enemies were subdued under David's generalship. Sharp guy. He was a very constructive administrator. The scripture says judgment and justice for all the people were under his reign, realm. We, we miss a lot of that. Because we focus on something else that certainly is also very important. Well, one other thing. He organized the priesthood into 24 courses. You need to understand that or you won't understand Revelation 5. The 24 elders and what that's all about. But in spite of being a good administrator and a clever general and a real military leader, he also was a major poet, probably the major poet of Israel and a major songwriter. We're struggling with 73 psalms that were penned by David, and some of the other anonymous ones may also have been ascribed to him. So he was their primary songwriter. Interesting guy. But his turning point was his great sin. And if nothing else, it's interesting to notice the honesty of the Scriptures. They don't, you know, wash over the failures of their primary hero. It's right out there. Adultery and then murder and all the rest. It was not an incident. The incident with Bathsheba. No, 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 no. It's a process. First he laid back. He wasn't where he was supposed to be as a general. He, you know, these things are a sequence of events. A prosperous ease, self-indulgence. Accumulating wives was forbidden in Deuteronomy 17, but he accumulated quite a few. But the good news is Remorse and re- he was remorseful and he repented. He confessed and he repented. That's what Psalm 51 documents for us. That's why in the Bible, the one person that is clearly identified as a man after God's own heart is David. God isn't expecting him to be sinless. He is a sinner. So are you and I. But he does expect us to repent of it, confess it, and deal with it because God has provided remedies for our sinful nature. Psalm 89, we'll get to later, of course, but I thought I'd throw it in here now as you get a perspective. God says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne unto all generations. Selah. We need to understand that despite these failures, that David enjoys a commitment of God. And Mary was given a promise that her child would sit on David's throne. David is exalted for all generations, indeed. Let's you and I remember something else as we deal with these issues. Galatians 6 1, another memory verse for those of you who are so inclined. Brethren, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Indeed. Praise God. 